The Shanghai Flood Control Center was established in 1951. 32 screens give live information about weather, rainfall, drainage, and emergencies. Flooding has always been a problem, but climate change is increasing its severity and frequency. Deputy Director Zhang Zhenyu has no illusions about the challenges ahead. These screens monitor sea levels, and they're rising. The only debate is by how much. I think a 20 centimetre rise by 2050 is a very optimistic scenario. Um, that's the best possible case scenario. There's a lot of argument about the, the science at the moment. But by planning on a 20 centimetre rise by 2050, Shanghai leaves itself exposed to significant losses. But Shanghai's flood control experts are confident about the future. So the increase in the frequency and severity of China's typhoons is already having an impact on Mr. Zhao's business. Mr. Zhao is aware of the larger consequences of the success of his business. There's more rubbish for him to collect because the Chinese are buying more goods. Increased consumption leads to more greenhouse gases and ultimately to global warming. Scientists argue adaptation to climate change must go hand in hand with action to reduce global warming. It's important that mitigation is implemented soon and substantially, otherwise it's quite possible that we, we drive climate change to a level and a magnitude uh, that exceeds our capacity to adapt. Yet China is building one, perhaps two, coal-fired power stations a week. Chinese power consumption is growing very rapidly. Uh, you know, the economy is growing at about 8 or 9% a year, and energy consumption is growing more like 10, 12% a year. If the Chinese are using oil at the same rate as America by 2030, they will want 100 million barrels of oil a day. Today, oil producers churn out just 84 million barrels a day. It could be almost 40% of world emissions by you know, 2020, 2025, which is a dramatic thought. Uh, the reason for this is that the um, main source of energy in China is coal. They are very well endowed with sort of lots of coal. It's cheap coal, but it's very inefficient coal, very low quality coal. So when you burn this, you produce a lot of pollution, uh, including a lot of greenhouse gases. 70% of China's energy comes from coal and 20% from oil. Hydroelectric power is the third biggest source, but accounts for only 6%. Other renewable sources of power are currently less than 1%. If they're going to get renewable energy up to something like, say, 20% of uh, total energy supplies within the next you know, 10 to 20 years, uh, which is the sort of goal that the US has set for itself, for example, they probably would have to invest between 1% and 2% of the total output, total GDP in renewable energy every year for the next you know, 10 to 15 years. Some of these costs could be offset by exporting the technology of new green industries. 
if they're really successful in building up a, a world dominating solar panel industry and a world dominating turbine industry and they're a big player in the electric automobile mar uh, market, say 20, 30 years from now, they might be able to offset a third to a half of that cost. Shanghai at night is a symbol of the success of China's rapid industrialization. Chinese energy policy seems to be ensuring a bright future. The goal is that by 2020, every unit of output will be produced with 20% less energy than today. The central government has the power to set these goals, but it doesn't always have the power to enforce them. A lot of the enforcement power lies with provincial governments. Provincial governments, provincial governors are really quite powerful in China. You know, the provinces are big, so the provincial governor is like the president of a, of a quite a biggish country, really. Uh, and these guys have a lot of economic power. So they really have to be persuaded to adopt these goals. And they tend to take a fairly short-term view of economic issues. Mr. Zhao is finally on his way with his day's booty to the recycling station. First, he has to sort the rubbish into categories like cardboard and plastic. He has no illusions about his job. But Mr. Zhao likes the fact that he's his own boss. Mr. Zhao gets paid about seven US dollars a day. After 10 hours trawling the streets, he heads home. For all its hectic pace and speed, Shanghai has another, more human side. The parks, especially on Sundays, are packed with all kinds of activity. I see community here. I see uh, something that they do every day, they're used to, they're energetic, they're involved in activity together with their neighbors. It's a very large extended family. It's a great place for recreation for the young people, as well as retired people. The Chinese government may not be a democracy, but to maintain power, it can't afford unrest. So like the West, if investment in climate change is not to be piecemeal, they will need the sanction of their citizens. People don't understand the threat posed by climate change. And there is a real risk, actually, of runaway climate change if we do nothing to control climate change, with temperatures increasing as much as 6 or 7 or 8 percent. And uh, in that case, you could really almost see the end of you know, civilization as we know it today. And if sea level were to rise 200 feet, for example, that would have a traumatic effect on existing civilizations. I mean, most major cities in the world would be wiped out. The true costs of preventing this kind of disaster are only being guessed at. Stopping climate change isn't necessarily cheap. It costs a couple of percent of output, but it's a good buy in taking the long run because the costs you save are much, much greater. Questions about affording climate change prevention are being raised all over the globe. Questions like that aren't asked when a country wants to build a new weapon system or have a new war. Nobody says, can we afford to do it? No, they've decided to do it. They find the money to do it. We have a war here. We have a war uh, against uh, misguided, non-adaptive uh, practices that are killing us all. China is already responsible for a quarter of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. As it continues to industrialize, this figure is predicted to rise to 40% in less than 10 years. As a result, the whole world is dependent on how China responds to the threat of global warming. The simple fact is China cannot develop as the West has. We need three planets of resources to do that. The good news is China knows that. I do believe they'll do alternatives that'll be good for them and the rest of the world. 
we, we just cannot afford to not change. We must adapt or die. In the next episode of Hot Cities, the sprawl of Los Angeles, a city built around the motor car. But LA's energy binge will have to end soon. Is climate change turning the Hollywood dream into a nightmare? <laughs>